If you were in the position to tell the entire world what you think is wrong with America, why we're in trouble, what would you say? And moreover, what solution would you offer? I'm going to share with you some thoughts today. I'd like to see if you agree with them, what you think about them. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. Finding and knowing God is a faith walk. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Our hope lies in the coming Messiah, who will establish God's peaceful kingdom on earth. This is Faith Walk with Ron Susak. Dr. Ron is an evangelist committed to encourage and equip your faith walk as we pass through these turbulent end-time days awaiting that soon-coming kingdom. Here again is Ron Susak. The other day, I was having my hair cut, and I have a favorite barber. His name is Ben, and I go to him, first of all, to have my hair cut, obviously, but more also because this guy can tell the greatest stories, and he's funny, he's intelligent, he's a reader. We have great um, conversations. And I asked him, Ben, what would you say if you had the opportunity to tell this nation and the world what is wrong with America? Why are we in deep trouble, and what's the solution? He took some time to think about that, and then he came back and he said, Ron, everybody wants to get a piece out of America for themselves. It's a selfish thing that we're doing. And he said, a lifetime goes by, and it's too late when people realize, we've missed it. We have missed it. And above all, we've missed God. He is absolutely dead center on target. I want to talk to you today, a straight talk, a sit-down talk with Americans, my family. But I'm inviting all my friends around the world to listen in, and here's why. What happens in America affects the entire world. And there are things happening in America that's an absolute shock and embarrassment to Americans as to what is happening out of America going around the world. And we need to address that. We need to come to the heart of what we're dealing with here in America. Our founding fathers had a very noble idea. They had tremendous concepts. And here's one of the things that they said. Here is the opening of our Constitution. Listen to this noble dream. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Now, there are some tremendous ideas packed in these words. I want to just mention some of them to you right now. That one of their ideals was to have freedom. They knew what it was to live under the bondage of a king who thought he was above the law and was willing to tax them but not give them any representation in decision-making back in their home country. And so here they were as pilgrims and uh, then eventually colonies. And what were they doing? They were living under the oppression of a king, that concept of governance. And what came of that? They got tired of that, and they threw that off by the Revolutionary War, and so they were fighting for freedom. Secondly, they wanted equality, equality for everyone, justice for all, fair justice, that everyone, no matter who you are, you get fair justice. Number three, they wanted security, both from foreign invasion and domestic terrorism and criminals. They wanted this kind of security. They wanted happiness. Everyone was to be free to pursue their own idea of happiness. Now, that one I I have questions about uh, because there's something deeper than happiness, and that is joy. And that only comes through salvation in Jesus Christ. However, they talked about happiness and they wanted to bless their posterity. Let's pass something good 
on down to our children and grandchildren and future generations. Now, there's a law that I want to mention. And I want you to mark this down. I'm going to ask our men to put this up on the screen. Laws must be written on the heart, not only on paper. And this is the work of God and parents. What? What is the work of God and parents? We have got to teach the next generation. Listen carefully. God says in the book of Hebrews that he is going to write his laws on our hearts so that we're not obeying because we see them on paper and there are police to enforce them, but we want to from deep within our spirits. That is written on our hearts by God, but also, listen carefully, here's where we have really missed it in America. God commands in the Old Testament fathers to teach their children the laws of God and the ways of God. It is so essential that fathers understand they have a high, holy privilege of authority that you can't, you can't buy it. It is there by divine design. And when we ignore that and violate that, we are jeopardizing our nation and we have done that for so long, we are now in very, very deep trouble. Now, Abraham Lincoln understood everything I've said so far. In fact, we've learned these things from our, our forefathers. Abraham Lincoln, when he was standing in Gettysburg at the Gettysburg battlefield to give the famed Gettysburg Address, listen to these words. He said that this nation was conceived in liberty. Deep within the hearts of our forefathers was the thirst, the craving, the desire for liberty. And wars have been fought in order to gain it and maintain it. Now, he wasn't the only one. Rose Sue said these words, A country cannot sustain well without liberty, nor liberty without virtue. That's law written on your heart. Virtue. Free people remember this maxim. We acquire liberty, but it is never recovered if it is once lost. Isn't that a tremendous statement? Once you lose liberty, you can't reclaim it. America is right now on the brink. We're on the brink. We're dropping over the cliff of losing liberty. And if we don't reverse this fast, we're going to lose it, and it's gone forever. Justice Robert H. Rat Jackson said, There is no such thing as an achieved liberty. Like electricity, there can be no substantial storage, and it must be generated as it is enjoyed or the lights go out. Isn't that an incredible statement? You cannot just win liberty once for all. Every single generation must have a passion for liberty, understand what liberty is, and fight for it, stand for it, and live it out. Judge Learned Hand said, Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. No constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. Liberty must be a yearning in the heart. Not, not, I want to do my own thing. I want to be free to do what is right and good and proper. John Curran said, Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Eternal vigilance. You have got to be focused. Every generation, the majority of that generation, un unfortunately, you always have those who don't get it. You always have those who want to be rebellious, do their, own th do their own thing, be their own person, rather than understanding the virtuous laws of liberty and freedom. Thomas Jefferson put it this way. Now, all these men are saying the same thing. You get this, don't you? You're seeing it. Thomas Jefferson said, 
Our form of government is not in our constitution, but in the spirit of our people. Did you catch those words? It's not what's written on paper that determines this nature, this nation. It's what's in the heart of our people. And if we don't have a passion and an understanding of what justice is and freedom and liberty, we are in deep trouble. And my friend, that's where we are right now. Listen carefully. We're having a straight talk today, my friend. This begins in our government. This begins in our churches. This begins in our homes. This begins in you. Are we ready to rise to the occasion of what kind of people it requires in order to gain and maintain freedom and liberty, morals and values and ethics? John Adams was our second president. He also signed the Declaration of Independence. Listen carefully to these words. Same thing, but listen how he said it. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. You couldn't put it better than what he did. Now, we have a great problem here in America. We call ourselves the great melting pot. We think that people can come and have any belief system and uh, any culture they want to bring. Well, my friend, listen carefully. While cultures can differ here in America, we have Latino culture, black culture, white culture. We have uh, the Assyrian culture from the Middle East. We have all kinds of cultures in America. No problem with that. We even have special parade days for different cultures. Rightly so. No problem. But my friend, listen carefully. There's one thing we cannot have, and that is a bunch of different gods. We all must be focused on the same understanding of God. Oh, we even had a president go so far to say as, this is not a Christian nation. Well, if it's not, what kind is it? There has got to be a fulcrum. There has got to be something that binds us together. And my friend, friend, we are in deep trouble because the thing that we have used to bind us together more than anything else is materialism. I want to go to America because there you can do what you want to do and you can make all kinds of money. My friend, if that's the motivation of a nation, we're dead in the water before we get started. The original purpose of our country here in America, I believe, began before the Constitution, before the Revolutionary War. I believe that the real concept of this nation began in 1620, when pilgrims were on the Mayflower, and they landed at Pilgrim's Rock, and the, the men gathered in the captain's quarters, a very small, tight captain's quarters, uh, and the steering wheel house, and there they wrote and signed the Mayflower Compact. And that compact begins with two concepts that are essential to this nation. And that is, they said, we are doing this for the glory of God and for the advance of the gospel. If that single-minded purpose had remained down through the decades until the signing of the Constitution, you would not have had a Constitution begin with the three words, we the people. You would have a Constitution beginning with the words, for the glory of God. And we exist as a nation for the advance of the gospel. My friend, don't you tell me that's not possible. That's only made impossible by rebellion against God by the rejection of his word, by the dismissal of his plan and his purpose for you and for me. Oh, you say, Ron, your problem is you're, you're a Christian, so you're biased, and you just, you're not tolerant. My friend, listen carefully. There is only one God. He is extremely well-defined, or he defined himself very well, in the Holy Bible. And what's interesting is everything we see in the world is an offshoot of that, either degenerating that or upholding that. And it is essential that we come to the understanding 
that this world is not moving toward a cataclysmic ending whereby everybody dies. Get that out of your mind. Get that fear out of your system. This world is heading toward an encounter with this God. We'll get there in just a moment. I want you to see that encounter. And when we have that encounter with God, those who came to know him now in this lifetime, on his terms as he has revealed himself in his word, will be in the coming kingdom of God that will be on this planet. That's what's coming. A tremendous grand future. Now, I want to say some things about the pilgrims because I am really troubled at how we have allowed Hollywood to disfigure the pilgrims and turn them into mealy-mouthed little weaklings who hold a Bible and, and when there's trouble, they get on their knees and pray and then they get shot. Oh, come on, friends. The pilgrims were the astronauts, the daring, brave astronauts of their era. They crossed an ocean that was very dangerous. They came to a country they didn't know or understand. In the first winter, over half of them died, but they did not lose sight of their purpose. They came to share with the Native American Indians the, gl the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's courage. And there's another group I want to defend, and that is the Puritans. Here again, our schools have played down the, the Puritans as, as a bunch of prudish people who had these oppressive disciplines. No, my friend, they had to have discipline because they were in a wilderness. They were up against danger. But listen carefully. Let me tell you about the Puritans. You think they were prudish? You read their books about sexual conduct. They really cut to the quick. They talked about depression, what it is, how it comes on, and how to deal with it. They were really smart people. And are you aware that the Puritans, when, when they had the first Thanksgiving, there were more Native American Indians there than there were Puritans. Why? Because the Puritans rejected what the evil people coming into America, it wasn't America at the time, I know that, but coming to this continent, what they were bringing, they brought with them something that you may have never heard of. It's called the law of discovery. The law of discovery. What was that? Well, if you were walking through the woods and you found a glen and it was beautiful and there was a pond on it and a lake and animals and you wanted that and you didn't see any teepees, you didn't see anyone else living there, that's the law of discovery. You own it, you live there. That did a lot of damage in our relationship with Indians. Puritans never did that. The Puritans always dealt in fairness with the natives of this continent. As a result, they were loved, they were respected. The Puritans were good people, intelligent people, hard-working people. They had an ethic that we need to recapture. Now, this was the what, what, what we call the Mayflower Compact. This was the incentive, the motivation, the directive of that. And the pilgrims and the Puritans were carrying out that incredible compact. And listen carefully. When we wrote the Constitution, we had degenerated to those opening three words, we the people. Now, where did that come from? I believe it came from the so-called enlightenment. I call it the endarkenment, a philosophy that was exalting the reason of man. In fact, if you go back and read the philosophers of the Enlightenment, many of them, when they would come to the word reason, they would capitalize it even if it was in the middle of a sentence because they were deifying the mind of man. We the people will always make the right decision. Put it up to a vote, we'll make the right decision. My friend, that has proven to be not true. You know that, and I know that. I made a list in preparing for this message. I made a list of sins of America all the way back to the beginning, down through the present, and I'm not sure that I'm going to try to give that whole list. It's a long list, and it's not even a fraction of what we've done. Here's my point. We're in trouble today because we have not dealt with God properly in the past. We've had 
awakenings, but they would come up the shore like a wave and then recede and we're back to our old ways. We need an awakening in this nation that is going to awaken our government spiritually, awaken our church spiritually. We have allowed the doctrines of demons, which the Bible talks about, being taught the doctrines of demons. We have allowed the doctrines of demons into many of our pulpits. We are facing very serious trouble because the doctrines of demons that have not only hit our pulpits and our government, but they have come into our homes by television, by cell phones, and here we are with a generation, many of whom have totally lost their way. They don't have a clue who they are, why they are, where they come from, or where they're going. And in that light, understand that if we were really a nation of God, we would not be opening our constitution with the words, we the people. I would highly recommend Congress consider a rewrite of that and begin it with the words, for the glory of God and for the advance of the gospel. Now you can say, we the people, under God, not on the top of the stack, but under God, now we the people. Here is what we are about and what we can do. Now let me just mention just mention some of the more modern sins we've committed against God. Think, think now, that the Supreme Court, some 50 years ago, gave the ruling on Roe versus Wade. That ruling was not a law. You cannot make a law in Congress. That is our structure as a nation, and we even have Government officials in Washington, D.C., who don't know our own governmental system. Kick them out. Come on, voters, kick them out and get people in there who understand why our framers put together three systems of government to balance power because they knew that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And in that light, they put in a balance of power. The Supreme Court never makes a law. They only upholds the law. The courts of the land are never to make laws, although they're doing it today. And isn't it tragic that we had, oh, rebels who took the Supreme Court ruling, which was not a law, and made it, in their words, the law of the land and Congress never made it a law. That means that 63 plus million citizens of America were murdered in wombs because we were lied to by some members of our government. My friend, are you beginning to get the picture of why we're in trouble? Why God has pulled back and said, you want to live in sin? All right. Let's show you exactly what it will do. Let me come to my closing thought today. We are moving toward an encounter with God. Jeremiah 30, 23 to, to 20, or rather 23 and 24 speak to this. And here's what God says through Jeremiah. Behold the storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. So don't be afraid if you're seeking God and walking with God. It's going to burst upon the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intentions of his mind. Now get this. This is not just speaking about in Jeremiah's time. It's speaking to you and me today. Look at this phrase, this sentence. In the latter days, you will understand this. You and I are on the verge of it. We're sitting on the latter days. If ever we have dealt with God, we need to deal with him now. And it begins with me. It begins with you. Yeah, we can talk about government. We can talk about all the other people. But right now, it starts with you and me. And I want to say a prayer with you right now. And I invite you to pray this after me, but think this through. Make it your prayer. Let's pray this together. Dear God, 
Forgive me of my sin. Forgive and be merciful to this nation. Bring an awakening. Open eyes to what sin is and rebellion against you, and bring about a great repentance. Honor your name and do this. And Father, I pray that you will forgive me of my sins, and by your faithfulness separate me from my sins as far as the east is from the west, because I'm trusting your Son's death on the cross to have paid for my sins. Give me the power to live unto you for your honor and glory from now until I meet you in heaven. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My friend, please get in touch with me. Let me know you're standing with me. Uh, Dan will tell you how in just a moment. God bless you and always remember the name Emmanuel means God is with you. Thank you for your gift to help Dr. Ron in building lives by advancing the teaching of God's Word through the programs of Faith Walk. You may never know until heaven whose lives you've impacted somewhere around the world. So please accept and enjoy your copy of God Will Answer as our personal thank you for standing with us at Faith Walk. You'll be encouraged and inspired as you open your gift book, God Will Answer, by Dr. Ron Susak. Each week throughout the year, within the pages of this rich 52-chapter hardcover edition, you'll discover compelling spiritual truth and biblical insights, content that will enrich your life and challenge your heart to go deeper in your faith walk with God. This has been Faith Walk with best-selling author, pastor, and evangelist, Ron Susek. If you would like to know more about Dr. Ron and our mission, visit our website at faithwalk.org. We're certain you appreciate Dr. Ron's straightforward teaching of God's Word, along with his strong invitation to find salvation through Christ. But he needs your help in spreading the gospel to the far reaches of the world. Join our team by going to faithwalk.org and clicking on Partner With Us. You may never know until heaven whose lives you've impacted somewhere around the world. So please accept and enjoy your copy of God Will Answer as our personal thank you for standing with us at Faith Walk. Well, thanks for being with us today, and we hope you'll join us again next week as we find courage for the journey in our Faith Walk.